Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Marco, Jen, Alex, and our other members are presenting Lindsay, Ellen, Min, and Joel. We're Team 58, and we're here to talk to you today about Zarnia's environmental plan for 2014. So on the agenda today, we're going to talk about the current problems that Zarnia is facing, their current initiatives, and then from there, we're going to talk about their five-year plan, long, our five-year plan, sorry, our long-term impact of our plan, our financials, and our conclusions. We have three main solutions that we're going to convey. Uh, the first one is to open an online forum. The second one is to create a website and newsletter. And the third one is to create an environmental conference. I'm going to pass it off to Jen, who will guide you through our current process. Thanks, Marco. So, the, in Sarnia, the Chemical Valley causes 14% of Ontario's total air pollutants. As we all know, air pollutants lead to environmental damage, health and safety problems, not only today, but into the future. The community in Sarnia is facing higher rates of rare forms of cancer. As well, genetic abnormalities in the form of higher rates of miscarriages and the increased <coughs> ratio of girls to boys being born into the community. In terms of the environment, species are becoming endangered because of bioaccumulation. Toxins are building up through the food chain, which is causing the animals to produce shells that aren't as easily, that aren't as stable, so it's more difficult for them to hatch eggs and move on to the next generation. At present, Sardia does have initiatives that they're working with to improve the environment. First of all, the air quality stations are in place to monitor pollutants in the air. These are then reported and trends can be tracked over time, which is constructive in the long term, so they know what actions caused by the corporations are leading to which pollutants in the air. Next, the NGOs in the community help the people get their voices heard. The municipality listens to their citizens and these means of getting people's voices across in terms of conserving the Great Lakes, improving the waterfronts, as well as monitoring <coughs> damage in the water in surrounding areas caused by the petrochemical industry in Sarnia. Regulation 419 was put in place to monitor air quality and toxins in the air. And this, this is also working to improve the current situation. However, all of these efforts will need to be increased in the future if Sarnia wishes to mitigate the damage to future generations and ensure that the resources being used today do not compromise the health and safety of future <coughs> generations. I would like, now like to pass it on to Alex to talk about our plans for the future. So as Jen said, there are a lot of existing environmental initiatives working towards improving the environment around Sarnia. However, going forward, Sarnia can do much more in order to further their goals and increase the, uh, the standard of living within their city. The biggest constraint that they have is that they are a municipality. This means that there's not a lot of power in their hands. They need the backing of their citizens and they need the support of the community in order to go forward. Our first solution is avenues for information sharing. These need to be increased. This they needs to be a direct contact between the municipality and the citizens over a large scale, not just small scale um, uh, meetings. This means a newsletter could go out monthly. This newsletter would be a monthly thing that goes out within the local paper that would communicate to them, just like a website. The website would also go up. This would communicate information similar to the NPRI. We went on this website and tried to use it, and the information that it gave was a little bit convoluted and slightly confusing. Um, it didn't really have a lot of definitions on what each of the things were, what each of the pollutants caused, or really the major effects on the community. By the city putting up a website that has really all the data from the NPRI aggregated into a single place that's easy to use and that communicates effectively what each of the pollutants does would be a great stride forward for the community. It would allow them to know what's going on. A sample report 
would have different companies right here. You can see Imperial Oil Shell and Suncor, just examples. What each of their pollutant levels are compared to their goals, compared to previous levels, and compared to possible legislative uh, limits that could be implemented. <coughs> um, under this, you can see the specific um, pollutants that are being outputted. The website would have specifically, you would be able to click on it and you'd be able to find out exactly what each of these pollutants does and what, <coughs> what the definitions are and what their impact is on the community. This will communicate to the locals what the impact of these industries are on their society. Um, looking at this, you can see Suncor, coincidentally, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, most improved uh, in reducing emissions. Um, congratulations, by the way. <laughs> uh, next, uh, involvements of all stakeholders. Um, now, right now, there are uh, existing meetings. However, these can be publicized in a much more effective manner, we feel. Having meetings that involve all stakeholders, the city, the corporations, and the citizens would be a great way for information sharing to exist between all parties. These meeting, at these meetings, citizens, corporations, and the city could all uh, view their opinions of problems. A corporation might have a problem with a certain regulation that might not be voiced properly to the citizens. So this direct avenue for communication might be a great way for them to sort of get their word out there, get their side heard. In addition to this, citizens will be able to effectively communicate to the city and directly to the corporations. Finally, we need to encourage new and sustainable business. Now, this is one of the most difficult things for uh, a community like Sarnia to do because there isn't a lot of power within it. It's very difficult to implement tax incentives that are effective and, uh, and sustainable. So we feel that sort of leveraging Sarnia's competitive advantages would be the best avenue for growth. Right now, they have a huge employee base that, are, that is concentrated in energy. They have a history of being involved in energy and they, this can be leveraged to really put forth the new alternative energy initiatives that are going forward. Right now, these initiatives already exist, but they can be greatly enhanced in the future. We propose that within five years, <coughs> in 2014, during Sarnia's 100th year anniversary, a green energy conference be held. This energy conference would bring forth politicians, bring forth citizens, companies, and really any interested parties in green energy forward so that they'd be able to see what a great place Sarnia is and what a great place it can be to invest and live in. Um, by hosting this green energy conference, Sarnia will be incented to <coughs> clean up their environment and have disaster relief plans. Because really, a city that has a green energy conf conference needs to have needs to be secure in their position as an environmental leader. This will this goal will provide Sarnia with the, the initiative and uh, the drive in order to be successful in the future. Now I'm going to pass it off to Marco, who's going to go through some uh, the Gantt chart and some financials. Great. So as you can see, our, our action plan moving forward, it is a five-year plan, uh, with the following the energy conference being the last part of our action plan. And sort of looking at the from a financial aspect, the our overall financial budget is $24,000, which we plan on taking from the city planning budget, uh, with their largest expense being the newsletter. Uh, we believe that the forms are free, because we're going to leverage the online uh, networks and online uh, user, user websites. Um, and the energy conference, uh, we don't have a cost for it, but we firmly believe in uh, corporate sponsorship and we feel that large corporations will be likely to sponsor these conferences to get their name out there and get their brand out there. Uh, as many of you guys know, uh, certainly has a rough reputation in the environmental aspect, but we believe that if our, if our solutions are implemented, that will help uh, we build that reputation. Oh. Uh -huh. 
Do you have to say about uh, <coughs> some, uh, I guess, not in my backyard issues with some of the green energy, especially with like wind power, a lot of people don't like windmills close to them. And even with the solar farm coming in here, a lot of the neighbors did have issues with concerns about reflection and other issues around the area. So how do you look at working that issue? I think with wind power, I think there's a definite knock in my backyard issues, um, especially nowadays. Um, really looking at sort of alternative sources, I noticed the St. Clair River has quite a lot of current going through it, possibly investigating, like, I know there's underwater um, windmills like that work off of tidal power existing today. I think, judging by the flow of the St. Clair River, it would definitely support something along those lines. Um, in addition to that, sort of, and really alternative and out there, out of the box thinking is sort of the example of the alternative energy that's starting to be known for. Um, when addressing sort of the existing issues with solar power and reflection, I think just educating the population and maybe starting off on a very small scale, and then going forward in the future years, sort of, um, once there's sort of early adoption, you can get like the mass population to buy into this part, these projects. Um, and just to expand on that. For the not in my backyard mentality to do with more environmentally sustainable energy sources, so the look of windmills in your backyard and how solar panels look compared to what Chemical Valley looks like and the reputation that they've gained from that, I think that my like obviously you guys would know better, but I would say that it might be a pride thing to have that represented in your community in the future. Um, I really like um, your idea about having like a newsletter or something like that, or like even maybe including like a local newspaper. Because um, when I was researching it, like their alarms go off in their community, and people might not know if it's a test or like if there's an actual emergency. And I feel having these kind of communications is really good. Um, <coughs> if you could talk about that like scorecard of like all the different companies. Um, what do you think the competitive advantages, disadvantages are for these guys? Um, and like, how do you get them on board to like dish out all this information on, about their strategies and about <coughs> their actual emissions? So, and doing it in a way that like people can understand. Yeah, I think with these scorecards, um, really it's just taking the data that's already available and making it into an easily easy to read and understandable format for the consumer. So I think the corporations would uh, likely get behind it um, because it is really a reflection on them right now. Um, I think they definitely have a bad reputation and like looking forward, I think they definitely want to show what their initiatives are and how they're improving them. So just a, sort of having a public scorecard that shows improvement over time, which is definitely I think one of the goals for most corporations with Sarnia would be a good way for them to reflect that. And I think having this information publicly available would definitely give them favor in the community and really get the support of the citizens behind them. Can you leave this up here? You mentioned uh, the bioaccumulation, the biomagnification, and all the impacts, not just on, on animals that are reproducing, but on human populations, um, such that they have, the, as you said, the highest um, ratios of uh, girls to boys being born. They have among the highest cancer rates. What, um, if these are the legislative limits of some of these toxins that are being put into the environment, have you given any thought over to um, how maybe legislation could be changed? Because obviously, if they're going under the legislative <coughs> limit and there are huge impacts to the environment and human communities, there's something wrong with the limit or how these chemicals magnified together. Were there any plans that you had for getting at the core of what's really going on with this? Um, first of all, I think that one thing to look at is trends over time. So companies have been reducing their emissions. And I we didn't look into how long it would take for them to change regulations and who they would have to get involved. But pending some involvement from the rest of the community and support from the Ontario government and the <coughs> work of the NGOs, in the future they could likely reduce the limits as long as their credits that they're giving on their credits that they are going to allow them to. Um, late last year there was also a big, uh, I guess, treaty signed between the U.S. and Canada on a federal and provincial level, which is kind of, that goes towards the Great Lakes water. Um, and improving that. So I think there's definitely the push forward within the Ministry of Ontario and the Ministry of Environment 
that they are really examining these standards and are trying to establish them. Um, and the agreement going forward, I think, would definitely sort of further water standards, <coughs> which would definitely go towards improving the legislative limits, which really aren't um, effective right now. Okay.